going to have a talk by Louisa Heinrich, the founder of Superhuman. She's somebody who's worked with big companies and is working with big companies like United Airlines, Procter & Gamble and the BBC on their new projects. And she exactly wants to talk about what does it mean, the Internet of Things, both sides of it. What, is, what are the pitfalls and where are we going? Louisa Heinrich. Thanks. Morning, everybody. Let's get this show on the road. Okay, so um, I have a very long title for my talk, but uh, I really wanted to talk about where the brick breaks, and by the brick, I mean these things. We've all got them. Um, and most of all, I want to talk about what all of this stuff, all of this connected stuff means for us, for human beings, for society, etc. Because that's really where I live. I mean, the, the name of my company kind of says it all. I think that, um, that technology has the capability to give us all superpowers, but only if we apply it correctly. And uh, so I'll talk a little bit about what I think that means. First of all, I would like to point out a pattern that I have seen in the last 18 years working in technology. Um, when I started, it was, I want a website. And I would say, excellent, why? He's got one. Right, this is allegedly Mark Zuckerberg's f first website. You can see the value being created right behind me. Um, then it was, I want an app. Excellent, why do you want an app? He's got one. Still a great idea. So now we have 2.2 million apps and counting just on Apple and Android, leaving out all the other platforms. And now, after CES this year, it's, I want to put the internet in that thing. Okay, why do you want to do it? Because the internet's in that thing over there, and surely it's a good idea. So, um, no, it wasn't a good idea to have a website because everybody else did. It wasn't a good idea to have an app because everybody else did. And it's definitely not a good idea to just connect everything willy-nilly without having an idea of why we're doing it. So, why are we doing it? The mobile started off as a fairly simple proposition. We had phones. We used them to talk to each other. The phones were tethered to a place. We wanted this to be different. So we made phones that we could take with us to other places. Brilliant. As time has gone by, that phone is now no longer just a phone. In fact, the phone is the last thing that we use on it. I can't remember the last time somebody actually called me to have a conversation. It is our map, our A to Z, our flashlight, our calendar, our camera, our TV, our hi-fi, our everything imaginable, right? And uh, it's also got the whole of the magical interwebs on it. And it's also got everyone we've ever met. So this thing should be giving us superpowers, right? And to some degree, it is, right? I, if I can't remember something, I Google it. If, I, if I'm at a pub quiz, I'm guaranteed to win as long as I've got the fastest smartphone in the room. Um, but there's a downside, a couple of them, actually. The first one is that even though the whole of the internet and everyone I've ever known and everything that I care about is in this thing, when I am looking at this thing, I'm by myself. I'm not with you, I don't see you, and if I'm really focused on what I'm doing here, I don't even know you exist. We, are, we put ourselves in these cocoons in order to be social, which is kind of bizarre if you think about it from that perspective. Another thing that's bizarre is all of this stuff that these things do, the camera and the flashlight and the blah, blah. Um, if these were actual objects, do you think we would carry them with us on a Friday night out on the town? I mean, there's a reason we ladies have multiple handbags, right? You, have, you need a bunch of stuff during the day. In the evening, you really only need, you know, keys, lipstick. So I'm interested in what wearables, what connected wearable objects can do to start breaking this down thinking about what superpowers you want to take with you on a particular Friday night. Um, these are the wearables that we have now, and some of them are starting to head in that direction. We've got the, this concept of Google Glass, a thing you wear on your face that can feed you information as you go about your day. Um, we've also got lots of things that passively track what we do. What I don't feel like we're getting at yet is the question of what do we want to do? What do we, people, humans, each of us, wish that we could do better, faster, more? And not just generally, but today, right now. So I'm at a conference today. 
I actually don't want to be lugging this thing around with me. I have to because I have to present something lovely to all of you. But uh, if I were out at a bar at night, I would not want Twitter. I would not want email. I don't need any of those things. I'm in the room talking to my friends. I need to be able to contact them, but I don't need everything. So I'd like to see what happens when we stop thinking about what we can do with the technology and start thinking about what we can do for humans, what we can do for ourselves. Because one of the challenges with wearables, with, especially with the quantified self movement, is interpretation. So it makes all this data, tracks how many steps I take, how many press ups I do, how, how long I go swimming, etc. Um, but what does that mean? What does that mean for me? And generally, these things are interpreted against benchmarks. Somebody out there somewhere, don't know who, has decided what it means to be good, to be healthy, to have a rich life, to whatever that means. And if I subscribe to that, then I am essentially wearing a thing on my body that is going to be cross with me when I don't do what it thinks I should be doing. Who decided what I should be doing? I should be deciding what I should be doing. I should be deciding what's meaningful for me and where I want to go next and what I want to be next. And moreover, um, I should be able to make meaning of this. So I'm not interested in quantifying myself. I'm interested in clarifying. I'm interested in understanding myself. I would like to see us move beyond the quantified self to the clarified self so that we become the agents in our own world. We become we become the decision makers, we become the people who understand what's happening around us and what's happening within us by virtue of the technology. There is another place where you also kind of want to be the king of your own universe, and that is at home. This is sadly not my house. I wish it were. It's, uh, and this is another place where there's a, a massive wave of new tech coming in, right? Connected toasters, connected the internet refrigerator, which I discovered the other day when I was at ThingsCon, um, there is an IoT browser made by Usman Haq, and we pulled it up and we were looking at what was around. There is, people, important, even as we speak, at least one internet refrigerator in Mitte. Don't know who it belongs to, but there is one, which I think is strange. Um, anyway, yeah, so we, we, are, we are now putting things in the home. We're putting things in the home that are connected. and. Uh, and I don't think we're really thinking these things through. Um, some of them are beautiful. Some of them really do let us do things that we wish we could do better. This is the Good Night Lamp, uh, which is a project by my friend Alex. And the Good Night Lamp lets you communicate with people who are far away in a really intimate, really intuitive, really beautiful, really straightforward way. We've got the Nest. Helps you control your energy costs, helps you be more energy efficient. Clever thing, learns, etc. These are productive objects. We've got the Roomba, everybody's favorite robot. And uh, it's with the Roomba where things start to get interesting for me. So humans, all of us, have this tendency. When we encounter something that can do, execute a task, understand something that previously only humans could do, we tend to ascribe it human qualities. So. Uh, you will have noticed most people call Siri she. When actually, you get a lot better results out of Siri when you start treating it like an algorithm and not like a human. Uh, it's not human. It doesn't understand you as a human. It understands certain words. And uh, similarly, I haven't seen a self-aware nest yet, but there was a Twitter stream for self-aware Roomba. The Roomba was in love with the cat. The Roomba was a bit of a voyeur. The Roomba went out on an adventure on the streets. Um, Almost immediately, almost as soon as these things hit our homes, we started making something up about them. We started doing interesting things with them, um, which I think is a good thing, but I think it's also something we need to be very aware of when we design and develop products, because uh, we trust these things, we expect these things to fix our lives, to make things easier. And you will notice that whenever you see pictures of these things, they're always in these pristine, beautiful environments. Everything is clean and neat. And the reality is, life is a lot messier than that. This is also not my house. Um, 
but, uh, but life is a lot messier than, than we often think about when we are designing or thinking about these products. And, and sometimes I think that can make some interesting messes. So I was thinking about this a couple of weeks ago and I thought, right, um, at some point in the next couple of years, I'm going to redo my kitchen. And uh, by that time, I'm sure that I will want to have the mechanical blinds that I can control on my iPhone or that go up and down based on the time of day. And obviously, I will want the, uh, the new coffee machine that has the milk in it and you know, senses when I'm awake based on the connects with the nest and knows my habits so it makes me coffee that's ready by the time I need it. And, uh, oh God, sorry. And I will obviously want the brand new solar powered dishwasher because I want to be even more energy efficient. And I will need the click and grow for my plants because I travel a lot and I want them to not die while I'm away. And obviously I will have the nest or whatever its successor is. Um, now let's think about this for a minute. If all of these things have solar sensors in them, it's not hard to imagine a scenario when all four of these objects are at war with one another about whether the blinds should be open or shut. The coffee machine wants the blinds closed because it'll keep the milk fresher longer. The, the dishwasher wants the blinds open because it powers itself so it can run when I get home. The plats also want the blinds open because they want the sunlight and the sunlight makes them happy. The nest wants the blinds shut because it's getting hot in here and the temperature is not optimal. So who moderates this? Anyone? Yeah, it's going to have to be me, right? And, and I would like for each of you to just take a small moment and think about the hell that that would be. Going into the individual interfaces for each of these things and trying to teach them to not get cross with one another. Can you imagine how difficult that would be? I mean, most people's VCRs their entire lives just had flashing zeros. I've got a cooker at home that has a completely random time on it because setting the time on the cooker is a complex maneuver that I can never remember how to do, so I have to go on the internet and download the manual and search for it and find it, and I just can't be asked. So, you know, my, my cooker will say it's 1.15 in the afternoon when it's actually like quarter past five. Um, so, my point, I guess, is that we might think that we're getting Rosie the Robot. Um, does anybody here remember Rosie the Robot? This was a... Space Age cartoon, the Jetsons, you know, we're going to have this future. And, uh, and the great thing about Rosie is that she's a robot, right? So you don't have to feel badly about making her do stuff that you would never ask a person to do. Clean something really filthy, you know, jump off the flying car, she'll be fine, she's a robot. Um, but Rosie was also clever enough to help discipline the children and uh, help anticipate when things were going, when things were going to go wrong. Rosie took care of shit for us. And I think sometimes that when we talk about connected objects, connected home, wearables, we are expecting Rosie to come along and fix everything. But, uh, but that's not really likely to happen, at least not any time in the near future. Instead, um, my old colleague Matt Jones used to say, we should aim for things that are about as intelligent as a puppy. Perhaps not as excitable, as a puppy, but about as intelligent as a puppy. And then we have the question of, if you have two dogs and three cats and four birds and a ferret, um, what happens when you're not at home? When you are at home, you are the master, and ideally they all do what you say, unless you have cats. Um, but when you go away, who's the boss, right? Is it the cat, is it the dog, does the bird just poo on everyone? Uh, you don't know unless you set up cameras to watch them, God help you. Um, but I think that this is, this is an area where we need to be, again, thinking about, thinking about the person at the heart of this. I think that uh, people are always the heart of the system. We're the heart of our own lives. We're the heart of our homes. We are the ones for whom things need to work or not. We are the ones who will make products successful or not and brands beloved or not. So I would like to leave you with the very simple message of design for people Love the shininess, I love the shininess, but don't get distracted by it. And most importantly of all, please make awesome shit. Thank you.